Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the Environment Panel. How can we achieve climate action now? This is a real pleasure, um, and I hope we can meet your expectations. I'm very excited to introduce you to our, our panelists here today. Um, my name's Hannah Skeets, and I work for Wells Fargo. Uh, we're sponsors of this event. Um, Wells Fargo, like many companies, is increasingly aware of the two-way relationship uh, and interaction with the environment, and I'm a personification of that. Uh, my role is to run environmental, social, and governance investing at the asset management part of Wells Fargo. So we know that every day, uh, young people across the world are taking action, looking to have a positive impact on the environment uh, and uh, the interaction with our natural world, our survival system. This afternoon, we're going to hear some inspirational stories from young leaders, uh, how they're leading in their communities uh, to create a more sustainable world. We hope these stories uh, will be useful in giving you an insight into action that can be taken, action that can happen at a local level, regionally, nationally, and indeed globally. Um, as you know, we have an app today. Uh, the way this is going to work is this will be an interactive session. Uh, at the latter parts of this hour and a half that we have here today, uh, we'll be able to look at questions that you submit. So if you go onto the app, find this session on the schedule, there's an interactive piece that you can click and you can submit your questions and they'll show up here and we'll ask those um, in the latter parts of the, uh, the afternoon. So. Um, the way it's going to work, we, uh, additionally, each of our fantastic panelists that's joining us here today is effectively going to tell us their story. We'll hear from them individually and give them time to speak so that we can hear what they all have experienced and how that's worked. So without further ado, um, it's my honor to introduce this global lineup. Um, I'm going to introduce them briefly initially uh, and then more extensively before they uh, each speak. So. As a special highlight, uh, we're delighted to welcome the UN's youth envoy, Jayathma Wickramanake. Next to Jayathma, we have Alejandro Alfaro from YMCA Nicaragua. Then Karen Joy Feltavero from YMCA Philippines. Lawrence Fambula from YMCA Liberia. Tony Almir from YMCA Lebanon. And at the far end, but more local to the UK, Joe Herbert James from the Tear Fund here in the UK. So, we'll kick off with Jayathma. Jayathma was appointed the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth in 2017. She is both the youngest senior official in the UN and the first woman to hold the position. In addition to serving as a representative of the Secretary General and advisor, her work looks to expand the UN's youth engagement and advocacy across sustainable development, human rights, peace and security, and humanitarian action. Um, originally from Sri Lanka, Jayathma has worked extensively on youth development and participation uh, and has played a key role in transforming the youth development sector in her home country. So, I guess we ask you questions at the highest possible level and the broadest level. Thank you so much for being here. What do you see as the most critical changes we must make to create a more sustainable world? First of all, I'm very glad to be here and yesterday after a fantastic opening ceremony to sit in this panel and dive deep into some of the issues that I spoke about in my opening uh, speech, which is climate change um, and the role of young people in combating climate change and sort of how we utilize the energy, creativity, optimism that our generation brings to this world in order to bring urgent climate action as it's needed. To, to answer your question specifically, Hannah, when you ask what are the most critical changes, I can think of a few. I think the first critical and the most critical change we need to make is in our mindsets, in our systems, in, in practically everything we do, starting from the United Nations, is how we measure development. Right? What does development mean? Um, is development only limited to economic growth? What is the point of having economic growth at a, 
at the cost of social justice. What is the point of having economic growth if we at the same time are going to kill our environment and kill our planet? Um, is it enough to have economic growth in a country where there's no transparency, no accountability, no rule of law under authoritarian regime? So what do we really mean by development? And I think if we find the answer, the right formula to this question, a lot of the issues that we are facing when it comes to climate change can also be solved because at the end of the day, we will be, we will be driven not solely by economic growth and by the greed of achieving economic growth, but really by thinking more humanely about the lives of people and about the life of our planet. Uh, so that is number one. And number two is we cannot talk about climate change without talking about the communities that are most affected by climate change. And in my travels all around the world, when I speak to communities, I see that women and girls, young people, children are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change all around the world. Communities that are poor, communities who do not have access to basic social services like education and healthcare, tends to be more and more marginalized when climate change impacts hits their community. So we cannot really talk about climate change without forgetting the intersectionalities within our own society and seeing how the people, the most poor people are the most affected by climate change. So I think when you ask about critical changes, I would say the first one is to reform the way we see development, we measure development, and the second is we put those who are being left behind first in our climate action response. That's, um, th those are huge things to change. Do you, and obviously this is something you work on and you think about all the time, what are the ways that you've considered how we shift that mindset from economic growth first and these other things as secondary considerations? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's different levels to it. And definitely the first level, it has a personal level. As a person, as a human being, what, are the sets, what is your set of values and what are your sets of principles when you talk about, say, responsible consumption? Are you a responsible consumer when you go to a supermarket, when you go to a shop, when you go clothes shopping? Are you actually conscious of the decisions that you are making? Um, if I just put a question back to the audience, can you please show me by, the race, by raising your hands how many of you took flights to come to this conference? So many of you did. Um, did any of you calculate what the carbon footprint was like in your flight? Can you raise your hand if you did? So a little, some of you did. So for an example, what I do is, because my travel uh, includes a lot of, my work includes a lot of travel, when I travel, I calculate what my carbon footprint is, and there are measures that you can take to reduce that carbon footprint. So for an example, I try not to travel as much as um, I would like to, but say we use video conferencing and other methods to connect with audiences. But also there are projects where you can offset your carbon footprint. You can actually visit unfccc.com and it's a UN website where they give you proposals about different projects in developing countries where you can invest and offset your carbon footprint. So there are measures that you can take at an individual level to um, be a responsible consumer and to uh, take daily action in your day-to-day -day lives um, to help combat climate change and effects of climate change. But at the same time, I think the other massive change or transformation we need is in politics, because some of these uh, policies and programs that we are talking about, like transitioning the entire transportation sector of a country or transitioning the entire energy sector of a country, is at the end of the day a political decision. So engaging young people in political conversations, in voting, in running for political office, in engaging in political parties, become a part of an advocacy group is extremely important, but also putting pressure on political leaders to make the right decisions to convert our economies from carbon to renewable energy is also super important. I agree very much with a lot of people who say that through daily actions, through personal action, we can achieve climate action. But also at the same time, if you look at the statistics, only 100 companies in the world are responsible for 80% of global carbon emissions. Only 20 
30 countries in the world are responsible for 71% of global carbon emissions. So these are um, big policy decisions that these companies and these countries need to take if we want to achieve transformational climate action. So I would say it's a mix of both personal and political commitment if you are serious about solving the climate crisis. So you're talking a lot about taking responsibility. We can all take responsibility and make our own choices. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to this at any other level? Otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to move on to Alejandro, uh, and then please, all of you should feel. Uh, I'd like to well, uh, ask all my panelists to kind of comment as you see fit. Um, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I'd nice, now like to, like to introduce Alejandro Alfaro from YMCA in Nicaragua. Um, Alejandro is joined uh, by Claudia, who will be translating. Uh, Alejandro is going to be speaking to us in Spanish. Um, he's a project coordinator for strengthening resilience and livelihoods. The YMCA in Nicaragua works with rural and indigenous communities in climate change resiliency, helping sustenance farmers learn new agricultural techniques to overcome climate change while protecting the environment. Nicaragua also trains young leaders in community organizing to prepare and mitigate for the effects of more frequent natural disasters such as flooding. Welcome, Alejandro. Um, what do you believe is the true heart of the problem that this Climate Action Summit should be focusing on? And how has your experience regionally uh, at home ex influenced this? Sí, bueno. eh, en primer lugar, gracias por estar acá. Gracias por la oportunidad. First of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Eh, durante los últimos 30 años, ACJ Nicaragua ¿verdad? ha venido impulsando programas de desarrollo ¿verdad? con jóvenes y familias, eh, principalmente en las áreas rurales que viven en situación de pobreza. Eh, para ello hemos contado con el apoyo de, de organismos internacionales ¿verdad? y de la misma ACJ que nos ha estado apoyando. Uh, during 30 years, the YMCA in Nicaragua has uh, developed programs aimed at young people and families, especially uh, in rural areas where uh, they live in poverty or, and extreme poverty. For that, uh, we have had the support from the wider YMCA family and organizations uh, who channel resources in uh, international cooperation. Un total de 22,199 jóvenes y familias provenientes de 42 comunidades urbanas y rurales indígenas participan en distintas acciones que como ACJ Nicaragua desarrollamos, eh, como seguridad alimentaria, generación de ingresos, emprendedurismo, saneamiento, eh, salud materno infantil, liderazgo juvenil, Eh, acceso a la propiedad de la tierra. A total of 22,199 participants, young people and families who come from 42 urban communities, uh, also rural and indigenous, indigenous participate in actions uh, promoted by the YMCA in Nicaragua, such as food security, income generation, access to work, entrepreneurship, sanitation, mother and child health, uh, land banks, uh, young people's leadership, and uh, the use of free time. Para poner un poco al contexto, este, estamos ubicados en, el, en Centroamérica. Eh, Nicaragua tiene una población de 6.3 millones de habitantes y el, el ingreso per cápita anual es de, de, de 2.080 dólares el país. Somos el segundo país más pobre del mundo después de Haití. So, to put things into context, Nicaragua is located in Central America with a population of approximately 6.3 million inhabitants, of which 63% are under 30 years of age. Uh, the Head, the annual head income is 2,080 US dollars, uh, for which the country occupies second place in 
uh, poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean after Haiti. Eh, el cambio climático también ha afectado a nuestro país. Eh, tenemos pérdidas de producción debido a las sequías que se están generando en los últimos años. Eh, climate change has also severely impacted the country. Uh, we have had drastic decrease in the production, in food production, uh, due to droughts that uh, we have gone through in the country. Eh, tenemos despales el uso indiscriminado de pesticidas por transnacionales que llegan y convencen a la gente de dañar el medio ambiente, de usar pro productos que no son los más adecuados, que lo que hacen es destruir la, el suelo fértil que tenemos. So, uh, the large corporations have been destroying uh, the land uh, through the use of chemicals and this destroys the soil. Eh, y un efecto que, que tenemos ya desde hace algunos años es que el producto del cambio climático no tenemos producción y la gente está migrando. And one effect that has been caused by uh, climate uh, change is that um, and the destruction that has been caused is that people have been emigrating. Eh, migran principalmente hacia otros países como Costa Rica. Eh, también este, tenemos a, a, a España, mucha gente se está viniendo. And uh, people tend to migrate to Costa Rica and also many people have been coming over to Spain. Y un efecto es la desintegración familiar que ocurre también. And one effect is the uh, breakup of the families. Nuestra, nuestro, nuestra organización se dirige, ACJ Nicaragua se dirige a brindar información a los jóvenes eh, que son el relevo generacional, que son las personas que van a tener acceso a los terrenos. Our organization, our YMCA organization has uh, action to give more information to young people who, we, who are the generational um, Uh, those in the new generation who will work the land. Estamos capacitando a los jóvenes en distintas prácticas agrícolas, hacemos con ellos escuelas de campo donde trabajamos y promovemos acciones que debemos hacer para, para mitigar los efectos del cambio climático. We are teaching our young people to work the fields in our field schools uh, to mitigate uh, climate change. Y para contestar un poco la pregunta, porque puse un poco el contexto de, de nuestro país. And to answer the question, as I put a country uh, into context. Creo que la cumbre debe enfocarse en el contexto en primero de cada país. I believe that the summit has to focus primarily uh, in the context of every country. Deben enfocarse en la reducción de los efectos de los gases de efecto invernadero. They have to focus on the reduction of greenhouses, el uso de, uh, greenhouse effects. El uso de tecnologías amigables con el medio ambiente, como paneles solares. Uh, the use of uh, environmentally friendly technologies, such as solar panels. Frenar la deforestación. To stop deforestation e implementar acciones de reforestación and to implement action, reforestation action. el manejo de la basura uh, to manage the refuse. impulsar actividades que respondan a las necesidades de, de, de las familias campesinas to promote activities that will uh, be aimed at uh, uh, people in the you know country people y hay que informar por todos los medios posibles, tenemos WhatsApp, tenemos Facebook, tenemos la televisión. Creo que eso, ese tipo de, de, de instrumentos los debemos de, de utilizar para informar a nuestra población a nivel mundial. And we have to use modern technology such as WhatsApp or television to inform the entire population of this uh, change, of this action. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alejandro. Um, 
It's really interesting to hear from a very specific sp perspective um, on your country. I think we probably all have more questions to ask you about exactly what is going on and um, both on the issue side and then what you're, what you're doing. And maybe we'll come back to that. Um, uh, I'd like to use this also as a prompt to say we'd love to hear your questions as well. And if you could add them into the app, um, then we'll see them popping up here and we can, we can add those later on. So please do ask, please do think what you'd like to ask our panelists um, and we'll take a look at what we could ask them later on. So moving on to Karen, um, this is Karen Joy Faltevero. Uh, as I said, she's from the Philippines. Um, not only is she from YMCA in the Philippines, but also is um, uh, a World Alliance of YMCA's Executive Committee member. Again, if you take a look, you can see her extensive bio uh, on, on the app uh, about this session. Karen's a leader in the Makati Youth Group, um, a volunteer group of the Makati YMCA. One of the club's programs is the Green Ambassadors Program, which educates youth on the importance of climate change, promotes taking action, and engages youth uh, from across the community and community schools and organizations. Um, and I think maybe perhaps from what we heard from Alejandro just now is that it's easy to feel guilt as we think about this topic, um, whether it's about what we're doing or what we're not doing or the situation that we're in in its totality. But how do we transform that feeling into action and urgency? And if you could tell us a bit about what your experience has been, um, what we're hoping is that that can maybe replicated by others. So Karen, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, that's true. Uh, it's easy to feel guilty, but I don't necessarily see it as a bad thing. I believe the way I looked at it, uh, we feel guilty about the things that we care about. It may be because we're not doing something. It may be because we're doing something, but we could do more. Or it could be because we are doing something that we're not supposed to be doing. So I guess the first step is for us to realize or to understand why am I feeling guilty. And uh, having that feeling of guilt, it makes you, it gives you an opportunity to actually reflect on what I could do more. In my experience with the YMCA, I think the first exposure that I've had with environment was when I was 13 years old. We went into this landfill in uh, the Philippines. So that's where all the garbage is being thrown at. Um, for Metro Manila. But the problem at that time is I don't have that much, that agency yet. It wasn't because I was young, but it was more, I had an awareness that, you know, this is bad and we should be more careful about how we throw our, our ways. But then I did not really take an action. So I guess that's where guilt becomes a bad thing. When you realize that, but then you did not take an action. And then fast forward two years after I got involved with the YMCA, and uh, what we did is that we got an exposure, information, uh, a lot of information about environment. And uh, we were exposed in, this, uh, in, in a watershed. We did some tree planting. So it also takes a lot of, it also takes having a platform, having people who would be mentoring you and who would be guiding you throughout your uh, destination or throughout your advocacy work. And uh, this is what we are doing currently uh, in, in our local YMCA. We have a group of young people in the Makati Youth Club, and everyone has different advocacies that they want to, to partake in. And what we do is that we try to encourage one another on to take action. And how do we do that? As first, we have to be able to have all this information. We try to dialogue with each other. We are currently finding uh, the different stakeholders that we could, work, we could work with. And we were very lucky to find that in the, in the community near our YMCA, there is actually a group of homeowners who would like to take, uh, to have uh, actions on particularly on their environment. And uh, that's where we come in. We try to partner with these different stakeholders and it's very interesting because initially the guilt feeling that we have can be turned into action once we were able to find the community that we could work with. So I guess uh, to, to sum it up, it's okay to feel guilty, but 
how do we turn our guilt into action is by realizing why do we feel guilty by finding the people that we could work with and by asking ourselves, when, are, when am I supposed to start? And cliche as it may sound, but the best time to start is now. And you, you talked about some examples there about finding stakeholders and some homeowners. Maybe you could, maybe you could give us a little bit more color as to what that meant and how you acted so that we can really imagine what, what's been going on in your community. So uh, from the community that we work with, the Makati, Makati is uh, situated in the central business district of the Philippines. And uh, in one barangay, it's called San Antonio Village. We, what we did is we partnered with the village head, we call it the barangay captain, and tried to ask them, what are the issues in your community? And one of the problems that they cite is that they wanted to do more when it comes to waste segregation, because we're not very efficient when it comes to it. So, uh, and the, luckily, the barangay already has their organized group of um, homeowners, and what we do more is we try to give them more information and then we try to make it more participatory by asking them, what do you want to happen in your community? And uh, from there, what we do more in the YMCA is that we try to provide technical assistance. We try to link them with other uh, organizations that they could work with. And do you have, um, is the way that your effort is organized, is it, is it separated into lots of different kind of streams of work? Or um, do you have certain things that you focus on or do you take all your um, take all your kind of kickstarting from where the community actually wants to um, undertake action. Yeah, the first uh, step that we do is like really to ask them what do they want to do. So from there, uh, because we already have our trust in the YMCA, and one of that is the environment, as discussed also coming from the different young people that we work with, this is one of the things that they want to, to really work on. So. Uh, having to, we, we just had to ask the community on what do you want, wh how do you envision it, and then let's try to work together. And I have, I have one more question for you, which is about the, um, the youth in your community. Is there a particular um, aspect of environment, whether it's something that is uh, on the negative side or something that they positively want to do? Is there, is there one, one area that your, your region is particularly interested in and your groups are particularly interested in? Are because the Philippines is one of the, I think we were top two in terms of polluting the oceans. And we are not, as I mentioned, we are not very efficient when it comes to waste segregation. So that's where we try to come in. We go to the different schools that we have, and then we try to have more on, the first approach is really on information dissemination. We try to communicate with them, why is it important to segregate, and how should we do it. And the, I think uh, another thing is for, for these young people, when they are able to have the information already, then they can also influence their community and their immediate, uh, I mean, their family and then their immediate community. That's really interesting. Thank you. And I think, you know, what you're talking about there is information and the very first step being that information. And it feels like that's tangible, something anybody could kind of be involved in and start to do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Karen. So I'm going to turn to, uh, to Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence Fambula joins us from Liberia. Um, he is a youth and community development officer, uh, has experience in community mobilization, community support, and youth development leadership. Uh, YMCA Liberia has completed a mapping and profiling of 113 communities in the greater Monrovia area. Uh, based on this, the YMCA in Liberia is working with other institutions to provide sanitation services um, uh, and to support these communities. So, Lawrence, thank you for joining us. Thank you for making the effort uh, to join us here today. Your work has been across the country. Um, could you explain how that came about uh, and how you mobilized others? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. And... Uh, in Liberia is in West Africa. And um, in our country, there's a huge environmental challenges 
that we face. And so ranging from unsafe drinking water is an it's a serious issue. Um, we talked about flooding. I mean, sometimes if it rains, then the whole city is flooded with water. And that is because of lack of our drainage system. We also have a huge challenge of waste management. It's a huge challenge back in our country. And so on that basic, um, YMCA as an institution, as a community development institution, a youth development institution, decided to intervene. And initially, resources is a serious challenge. So we go back to the communities, we mobilize the community members, and begin to do training for them. We train them in um, environmental issues because capacity building, capacity gap is a serious issue too in those slum communities, especially in formal settlements in Liberia. So we talk to our old partner. We have relationship with Wakia International. We've been having relationship with them for the last 10 years. So we, t we spoke to them about those issues to intervene and mobilize resources for us. So we got into the partnership and we went back to the community because we wanted for the community themselves to take ownership of what is happening to them. So we started doing profiling. And profiling is more like knowing your city or knowing your community. We begin to realize that there are communities with over 75,000 inhabitants, and then you have only 10 toilets. Can you imagine that? Just 10 toilets. We think it's a huge environmental challenge. So we go back to this community, we mobilize the young people, and then we train them. In, do, in providing the training, uh, we got to realize how many of these structures are permanent structures, how many of the structures are temporary structures, and how many facilities they have in this community, like toilet, like water points, like business areas, and the rest of them. So when that is done, then we begin to provide training for them. Doing our training, we focus on waste management, which is a very serious issue in our informal settlement. Waste management has been the cause for flooding. Our drainage system is not very well, so because we don't have a complete waste management program, so people use the waste, the diet, everywhere in the community, and that contribute to flooding, which is a serious issue in our country. Another thing we do there is um, verification forum. So after the profiling, after knowing how many structures are in a specific community, after knowing how many are permanent structures, how many are temporary structures, then we do what we call verification forum. In our verification forum, we bring community members, we bring stakeholders, we bring youth leaders, we bring women leaders on a roundtable discussion so they can verify the information that we've gathered from this community. Our profilings are done by the young people themselves who live in this community. We don't go out because they know the issues, they know what's happening to them. So we go on the verification forum to verify whether the information gathered are correct and if the informations are not correct, then they give us the correct informations. Right after that, the next thing we do, we call settlement forum. So in our settlement forum, it's where now we outline the priority areas. There are too many challenges that you have. We don't have all of the resources to address these challenges. But can you kind of tell us, uh, can you kind of rank the challenges? Can you kindly give us your priority areas? So we as institution, we don't have all the resources, but we can partner with other people. We can knock those to ask other people that these are the issues in the communities. But number one is the most priority, number two, number three, and number four. And so we discuss those issues. For us as YMCA, as an institution, what we do, we do the read out we do the proposal writing because we already gathered the information. 
In our workings, we have one philosophy that says information is power. Once we gather those informations, we're going to share with our partners that work here, the Comic Relief, the Big Lottery Fund. Those are partners that we've been working with over the years. So we share those information with them, and then they see what priorities area they can intervene. And then they begin to give us funding, and then we begin to do the implementation. For us as institutions, what we've done over the years is, first day we try to uh, form different structures. In addressing community issues, it's not us, it's the community themselves. So we go back to the community and say, we want to provide training opportunity for young people who will lead the change. Then we form what we call the, the, the Disaster Risk Management Committee. The Disaster Risk Management Committee is a committee responsible to report hazard issues, disaster issues to the right authority. So we mobilize young people, we do the training for them, and they begin to do their work. Another one we do is we set up the hygiene or a wash committee. They're specifically responsible to engage the community to ensure that we have safe drinking water, that we have a clean environment, that we have a very good waste management system. That's what we do. The big challenge now we have in our implementation is the perception of the community. Imagine there are too many challenges you face in your community, then you have an institution like YMCA wants to intervene. We gather all of the information, but the community perception is the need, that they, they, they are urgent need. You spoke to the community, you asked them for their priorities, you asked them for the challenges, and they gave you all of this information. The perception is YMCA is about to solve all of their problems. And if that is not done immediately, then it comes back to us as institution. That's one huge challenge that we have. So we do the proposal immediately to our partners and say, this is something that we need to do. This is something. And one of the issues I did not mention has to do with uh, sea erosion. In many of our communities, like um, in the last two months, uh, the, because of sea erosion, we lost about 5,000 homes in one community called West Point. So as we move on, as we begin to engage our partners, our friends, this is exactly what we do in, in Liberia. And we ask all of you to join us to have a safe and green environment. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. I think uh, what, what you've explained to us there is taking something which is really doing like deep assessment and then the practical steps to get through to the how do we prioritize, how do we, how do we make this happen in, in, in very specific ways. So thank you for that, very, very interesting. Um, Tony, Tony Almeida joins us from uh, Lebanon. Uh, YMCA Lebanon has implemented multiple initiatives that have had effects on the Lebanese rural and urban communities. And I have a list here that is incredibly long. Um, I'll just give you a flavor of some of the some of the areas that Tony's been involved in um, and the YMCA Lebanon has been involved in. Water management and conservation, forest management, responsible ecotourism, uh, environmental education for youth and children, promoting afforestation, biodiversity assessments, uh, renewable energy use. Um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, from 2014, YMCA Lebanon was transformed from working on agricultural uh, development in rural areas to integrating into mainstream. So, Tony, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Maybe a little bit more personally, could you tell us what sparked your passion for the environment and the work that you're doing in the country there? First, uh, to, to tell the story of YMCA of Lebanon and what sparked the interest of uh, working in the environment, I have to put you in the context of Lebanon itself. Um, Lebanon had a destructive civil war for like 15 years long. It ended in the 90s. Uh, after that, uh, the destruction was so massive and we were like two decades behind any kind of development. And uh, that imposed some changes of, of priorities on YMCA of Lebanon. 
we had to move from being a, a youth-focused organization into developmental and humanitarian uh, organization. And we, we, we slowly begin to, to get our space and be the, the, one of the most important in Lebanon in the 90s and uh, in the second millennium. Um, we, had, we had to engage with different sectors to uh, cater with the needs of the communities. The destruction in, uh, was pretty much in all of the countries, but in Lebanon, uh, once you go far from the center, you have more poverty, more neglect, more lack of infrastructure. So we had, we had to uh, engage with multiple sectors to cater with the community's needs. Uh, the most important sector was health. So our, uh, our program is still running. We provide to 150,000 patients uh, chronic medications through uh, primary health uh, centers in Lebanon. Uh, it's all over the country. Uh, as well, we had like different developmental projects. It was also uh, um, on a, on a uh, grand magnitude uh, in rural development areas. So we did so many agricultural development, infrastructure uh, development in rural areas. As well, uh, there were a lot of women empowerment through cooperatives development. And of course, environmental, uh, the environmental aspect was one of the, the needs. In 2002, the World Bank assessed, assessed the environmental degradation in Lebanon by half a billion per year. It means like 3% of our GDP back then. Uh, and that was twice uh, the, the percentage of any developing country. And YMCA had to take actions. So we started with a, with a project in 2004. It was also the, supported by YMCA USA. And that, was, that is one of the uh, modules uh, that we can use when cross, cross countries, YMCA can support each other and collaborate. Uh, the program was Sustainable Environmental Practices and Policies, SEPP. And through this uh, uh, program, we made uh, a lot of infrastru infrastructure on solid waste treatment and water waste treatment. So we, we served through this, this infrastructure uh, approximately 90 communities in the southern areas of Lebanon. And we had also engaged through this program with uh, multiple awareness uh, programs. We reached to 100,000 community members through awareness about the environment and climate change. We also ran uh, a program for students in, in, in schools. Also, we reached for seven, seven, 75,000 students uh, during six years uh, period of time. And after that, also, like we, we kept working on the environment, on the environmental issues. Uh, we had we had uh, uh, multiple programs uh, uh, on capacity building for forest uh, rangers for uh, different CSO that have their focus on environment. Also, we had a program on youth environmental leaders. There are so many programs that I write it down here and I'm <laughs> getting forget forgetful. Um, also, uh, lately we've been working with the Minister of Environment in Lebanon uh, as a support, uh, a technical support team. Uh, we, we focus mainly on uh, investigative programs. We, we uh, do invest investigation visits to uh, uh, reserves. There are 14 reserves in Lebanon, natural reserves with biodiversity. And we have also 18 sites, which is considered cultural heritage. We also do investigation uh, uh, visits to these places just to, to prevent any violation from the neighboring communities. Um, uh, and also, we, uh, with, in the same program, we do uh, also for public health, our team goes to hospital to uh, monitor hazardous waste. Um, also, with, uh, we, we have work with them on uh, permits, hunting permits. Um, so you, you clearly, I mean, you clearly have a huge number of programs going going on at the moment. 
Is there a, is there a per, your personal passion comes from being part of your community or is there something more specific? And I'm thinking about given all of the programs that you have, there must be something where you feel that there is a personal impact that you, you can make through that. Through yeah, those of pieces. course. I, it's, it's important to conclude about like the war was the trigger, but what, what, we, what we inspire, what we inspired through is the, the needs of community and the solution we find for these needs. This is our inspiration. Uh, but what triggered us was the war in Lebanon and what changed us was the war in Lebanon. Of course, I think that YMCA of Lebanon and any, any YMCA in the world, considering what they are doing, uh, we are the most equipped organization to do like local impact and simultaneously on global level. Because, uh, you know, in our camps, in our training, what do we teach children, what do we teach kids? We teach them confidence, we teach them uh, co competence, competence. And we teach them also to build relationships. And you need all of these to, to, for, for, to protect the environment, to be aware that they can be uh, the change, they, they can actually do uh, things that matter, that do some impact on, lo on their local communities and then on global level. Thank you, Tony. It's obviously a huge amount going on there. We will come back and ask you more. Um, I'm, I'm definitely getting more questions here, which is good. So we will come to those uh, in a moment. Um, we're going to move, as I said, finally to slightly closer to home here in the UK, uh, to Joe Herbert James from Tear Fund. Uh, Joe leads on Tear Fund's theological work, promoting integral, integral mission theology and equipping churches, theological colleges and organizations, particularly across the US and Europe, although with wider global engagement too. Uh, Glo uh, Joe is, um, was educated here in the UK uh, and has a master's in theology in ministry uh, and specialised in the faith of millennials um, and the impact of consumerism um, and also leads on environmental and economic sustainability for Tear Fund. And it's the aspect of consumerism that we actually wanted to talk with you about today, uh, given your background. The rise of consumerism has clear impacts uh, on the environment, I think some of which we've heard tangentially from, from the rest of the panel here. What do you think it will take to reorient our thinking in this space, um, if that is, as I think we all suspect it is, part of the solution to what we're facing? Um, thanks for having me. Um, I think it's firstly important to remember we are living in the best of times and we're living in the worst of times. Uh, in the last 40 or 50 years, we have halved the amount of people living in extreme poverty. Now that's great news, right? Yeah? Not a trick question? That's really good. Uh, but what we have also done in that time frame is increased uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now I'm guessing we're mostly aware of that as we're here in this room and we're interested in this topic. But what we've also done is halved the amount of biodiversity we have around the world. Um, and we're hearing and we've heard, haven't we, the issues that it's causing. So we, yes, we're living in the best of times. Uh, there seems to be economic growth. Consumerism isn't all bad. Uh, we have access to so much more, uh, but yet we are having such a poor impact on the environment as we're doing it. Um, Tear Fund released a report just recently, No Time to Waste, and looking at that issue of waste around the world. Some of the statistics we found as we did that report are scary. Um, every 30 seconds here in the UK, we throw away enough plastic uh, to fill two double-decker buses. So that's every 30 seconds, whether you are awake or asleep, that's the impact we're having. In that same 30 seconds in developing countries, you see 30 busloads of plastic being thrown away or burnt in the same 30 seconds. In the same 30 seconds, uh, one person dies around the world because of the mismanagement of waste. And really this is because of our over consumption. And so 
I think it's an assumption to say that we're clear. We sort of know it's an issue, but I sometimes wonder if we know what's really happening and how to do anything about it. Um, but our system of overconsumption was designed this way. So the rise of that consumer culture happened post World War II, and it was really designed this way for us. Economists thought about how do we reboot the economy? Uh, and a famous quote from an economist, Victor Lebeau, writing in 1955, said, in order to continue this enormous uh, economy, we need things consumed, burned up, discarded at an ever accelerating rate. And that's the problem that we're in today. But the thing is, is it's got in us. So how do we reorient our thinking? This is much harder. So I spent about 10 years traveling around the UK, talking about this issue with young people. And I've just given you a whole bunch of facts. You probably know more. Uh, we know the issues and people care. They're excited about potentially changing things, but yet somehow it seemed hard to follow through. I know I should consume less. I know I should buy less stuff. I know I should use less plastic. But translating that into reality feels really difficult. So I went away and I studied this issue in much more detail. And what I learned was that consumerism works in two very powerful ways. So the first thing is that it wants to hijack your imagination. It wants to grasp your imagination. So when you see advertising around, it's really saying to you, imagine how great your life would be if you had these new clothes. Imagine how great your life would be if you had this newest technology or gadget. And when your imagination is evoked, what happens is desire is also evoked within you. Now, desire is a powerful capacity that we have. Uh, have you ever been in love or met anyone that has just fallen in love and desire? They would just do anything for that person. Uh, I recently got married, so I know this feeling well. Desire... Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, desire is really powerful. And so if we are going to reorient our thinking, it's no good us just saying we need to stop consuming. We need to do this and do that. We need to look deeply within ourselves and understand what's going on. We need to learn to reimagine. Now, I've been journeying towards a zero waste lifestyle for the last five or so years, which means sending nothing to landfill. Now, when I first heard about this, I was inspired and amazed, and I also thought it was impossible to live that way. But when I heard the stories, it captured my imagination. I didn't believe that there was another way to live uh, other than the endless consumption and throwing away. So I think we need to reclaim our imaginations. And the challenge for us in this younger generation is can we reimagine? I told you this was designed this way for us. So if this economy, this linear economy that extracts things from the ground, we use things and it is dumped, we need to reimagine. And some of that's begun to happen with the circular economy. So rather than this linear process beginning to reuse products um, and repurpose things, but how are we reimagining our future? The key um, is held in this generation. And so, but we've got to understand that that's a part of our job is to reimagine. Not all of the answers are out there yet for a sustainable future. And so we need to come up with them and imagine them and begin to use that capacity we have. And we're beginning to see more of that with young people in the UK reimagining in their local communities and at bigger scales, um, businesses beginning to reimagine. 
We've worked with young people that have started to create sustainable fashion businesses and all kinds of different things. But a key, it really sits with our imagination. Albert Einstein said, the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. Thank you, Joe. Great. Great, inspiring words there. Um, so now we come to the, the question and answer part of today. Uh, I have lots and lots of questions here, and I think, that, I think probably the best way to do this is for me to pick a few and throw them out, and uh, whoever has something to contribute, contributes. But there was one here that I thought maybe we would um, push in Jayathma's direction, if I can find it. Um, it was about the fact that, here we go, uh, and there's a lot, a lot around this. Uh, you said that there's a, there's a lot of concentration, or we heard today that there's a lot of concentration in impacts coming from a few places. And I think it's really bringing us back to that question of how do we continue to make individuals feel like they have uh, a role to play when we hear that actually there's a few places and a few countries where this is driven. So how do we connect the individual to the, uh, yeah, let's find your microphone, <laughs> to, the, to the overall? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question and I was also very carefully listening to what, what our colleague who finally spoke was telling. Um, let me put this diplomatically. Um, I think there's also an element to like this victim blaming um, right now going on in the in the climate uh, discussion and in the conversation where individuals or particularly young people are being told that this is your problem, you need to fix it, and it's your responsibility, and sort of. Um, trying to put the responsibility on young people when they had to do very little to create this problem to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of shifting the focus away from where actually the real problem is. That is, as our friend said, the, the problem with the systems, the, pro the problem with how everything is designed. Like, I think most of us who were born after 1990 uh, were born into an economy and a lifestyle which was like, we consumed like plastic products probably since our birth and mm -hmm. we kind of grew up with it and suddenly you're being told that it's wrong and you need to get rid of it if not the fault is yours without really looking at what created this system that made us so dependent on fossil fuels and so dependent on plastics, right? I have seen with my own eyes, for an example, fossil fuel companies um, financing advertisements and campaigns that says people should recycle in their homes. Of course it's important, we all should recycle, but why don't the fossil fuel company at the first place try to transform their economic model to, so to something you know, more sustainable and then tr uh, transform to renewable energies? So. Um, I think there is a very fine balance between what individuals and what young people can do when it comes to changing our lifestyles because it's very important to have a have our conscience have, have us know about the decisions that we are making and being empowered with the information to be able to make those right choices but at the same time to see commitment from where it should come from which leads me to the next point that is accountability in 2015, 196 governments came together in France, in Paris, and signed up to something called the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is the most um, important climate agree international agreement on climate change that we have in our world right now. Uh, the governments promised to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, re uh, transform their economies from grey to green economies, and keep the temperature rise, global temperature rise, below 1.5 degrees Celsius before the end of this century. Five years down the line, we are nowhere near that. And that's why young people like Greta Thunberg, that's why young women and men all over the world are striking schools on Fridays, coming out to the streets and demanding that our leaders stick to the promises that they made to each other and most importantly to the citizens. So that's why I keep going back. As much as we encourage people to live eco-friendly, sustainable lifestyles, we also need to be active. We need to take politics into our hands and really pressurize and really push our politicians to do better, to tax 
carbon, not people, and transform our economies to, from grey to green economies. Thank you. And I think what you're talking about there actually is a reflected in a, in a lot of the other questions that we see here, because not only do they mention Fridays for the Future, but, but the balance between um, who should take responsibility and who should take action. So I, I think, though, as well, what, we, what you're talking about is the fact that individual action is not just individual action at a, on your own, at home, personal level. It can be collective as well. Um, I was... There was questions here, actually, there's an interesting question here that I would be, uh, I think it would be nice to hear from a few of you on, that relates to kind of human nature um, and the inherent, uh, and, and probably it relates to consumerism as well, an inherent part of human nature that is to do with greed. And given the different types of background that you'll come from and the different parts of the world that you come from, this question about how we can sort of redesign our lives and take climate action when perhaps it goes slightly contrary to human nature. Um, would, who would like to comment on, on your part of the world and how you see people sort of acting in that way? I can see a couple of you. Go, go, for, go for it, Joe. Okay, sh shall I go first? Given that I am from the West, <laughs> which has caused so much of this because of greed, um, as I was saying, I think consumerism goes deep into our hearts. And I think unless we recognize that, we're not going to tackle the issue. Consumption isn't bad. Uh, I am a Christian. Tear Fund is a faith-based organization. And the way we believe God made us is to consume. So we need to eat daily. We need to regularly consume. But often it's like any good thing, too much of a good thing does harm. Um, and certainly from a faith-based perspective, we know uh, Jesus warns about greed in the Bible and to guard against that. Uh, and so for us, talking from a faith perspective, um, these are areas that we need to deal with. Living, for me, living a zero-waste lifestyle um, has been really profound because it's exposed my heart to myself more than anything else. Because in any given moment when I want something and I tell myself I need it, really it's a want rather than a need. And learning to live within limits, even just in my own lifestyle, is teaching me and exposing my heart and greed to myself. I think if we're going to tackle this, it has to start at home with us. That is still to say we need to be advocating and using our voices against systemic greed. And that often sits in the West. Um, and as Tiffany, again, we're campaigning here in the UK, in the Western world, um, particularly to big companies, that we are trying to put the responsibility back on them. But it's much easier to challenge others if we are tackling it in our own lives as well. And it gives us the integrity to challenge um, and to speak out on the issue. So I think it does speak deeply to human nature. Uh, I don't think it's impossible. Uh, I think as a Christian, I believe my faith teaches me how to guard against greed. And many faiths do. Uh, and so I don't think it's an impossible situation, but I think unless we are aware of it, um, we're never going to tackle it. Thanks. Uh, do, uh, any, uh, uh, Lawrence, please. Uh, how, how can we redesign our strategies? And I, I'm from Africa, especially West Africa. Poverty is an issue there. And so because of poverty, a lot of young people would prefer going after things for survival and forgetting the environment. They think it's not an issue. They think it's, it's the politician's business. It's not theirs. So the perception has been like, okay, it is the policy makers, it is the decision makers who are supposed to speak to environmental issues they have all the resources. They have made the decision. For us, we are poor. We want to survive. 
So we only go after things that will make us to survive, to have a better life. So that's a huge challenge all by itself. So um, how can we redesign our strategy, especially us young people? How can we get involved? In our country, we, we organize uh, a youth advocate for environmental advocacy in the different communities. So to begin engaging the decision makers, the policy makers, you don't go at the central level, you begin with your local authority. You begin to engage on those simple environmental issues right within your community. It is there you, you, claim, your, you claim your space to speak on issues at your local level. And then when you notice that it's healing results, you can begin moving it at the different levels. Uh, we have a challenge that uh, many of our young people are afraid to take decision-making positions or policy-making positions. Back home, when you ask um, a, a lot of young people about their stance in political activities, they prefer saying, I just want to go and vote, but they don't want to be voted for. And if you have that perception, it means that we're not going to change anything. Because if we must need a change, we must be at the policy decision-making level. It is only there that we can change those things. It is only there that we can redesign uh, a lot of things that we want to achieve at the end of the day. So um, environmental issue is not a one-day thing. It's not even two days. It's not, only, it's not even for you and I. It might be for unborn generations to come. But we need to begin the process. We need to set the basis so that other come, they can follow, and continuously we can have a better environment for all. Thank you. Thanks, man. Oh, I think, okay, we'll take both you. Alejandro, you look like you had something to say. Please. Sí, yo quiero agregar un poco, ¿no? I want to add a little. Eh, para nosotros, ACJ Nicaragua, eh, eh, el desarrollo es un proceso. Uh, for us in uh, YMCA in Nicaragua, development is a process donde yo como persona me hago responsable de mi propia vida para resolver mis propios problemas. Where I as an individual uh, become responsible for my own problems to uh, sort them out myself. Si yo no puedo resolver mis propios problemas, es difícil que yo pueda ayudarle a resolver los problemas a los demás. If I cannot sort out my own problems, it will be difficult for me to help somebody else sort out their problems. Entonces tenemos que estar convencidos de lo que hacemos, tenemos que amar lo que hacemos, tenemos que creer en lo que hacemos. So we have to be convinced of what we do, we have to love what we do, and queremos creer. En we have to believe in what we do. Eh, yo soy originario de una comunidad, me crié cultivando la tierra. I come from a community, I grew up uh, cultivating the land. Pero me di cuenta que lo que estábamos haciendo estaba mal. But I realized that what we were doing was wrong. Que la estamos destruyendo. That we were destroying it. Y por la gracia de Dios tengo la oportunidad de estar en ACJ. And thank God I have the opportunity to be uh, with the YMCA. Donde podemos llevar este mensaje a los jóvenes y podemos trabajar con ellos y cambiar esa mentalidad. Where we can take the message or this message to the young people and work to bring changes. Pero para hacerlo hay que estar con ellos, hay que vivir con ellos, hay que estar en las comunidades, hay que ser parte de la comunidad. But to do it, we have to be there, we have to live with them, we have to be part of the community. Y algo importante, este, nosotros debemos, debemos ser el ejemplo en las comunidades. And something important is that we have to be the examples in the communities. Si no nos ven como, como, como que, que somos el ejemplo, no van a, a, a seguirnos, no van a, a cumplir, no van a querer hacer lo que nosotros estamos diciendo. If they don't see us as examples, if we are not examples, they are not going to be able to do or follow whatever we are saying. Gracias. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, in the, the Philippines is also a developing country and uh, this is something that you would not hear most often but in our country when people talked about green lifestyle 
we are also talking about expensive lifestyle because uh, reality check, um, the Philippines view environmental challenges as also a, um, an issue of social class. Most of the people who are able to afford you know, green lifestyle are the ones who has the who can afford, who has who can go there or something like that. Um, that's why we are also known as a sachet economy. We produce a lot of waste, plastic waste, because most of the people would not purchase big shampoo, big amount of shampoo, but rather small sachet ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm trying to reflect whether it's actually greed that uh, that that's you know, driving people towards this um, uh, situation. And uh, that could be one. But then again, we have to look at really also the system. How, um, how open is the system for us on, our cli and on the different actions that we are taking on, climate, on different climate actions that we have? How can we really trickle it down or how can we bring it down at the grassroots level that is not alien to them or something that is that they can really work towards. So I guess with the YMCA or the different agencies that we have, we we have to be more to, to really work in a multi-sectoral level, really lobby with the with the with the government, really try to engage in the different business sectors on how they can create alternatives. And it's a long process, but I guess that's something that we also have to look at. So we have, we have a few minutes left. So I want to ask a specific question on a topic that I think a number of you brought up so that we can bring this back to really kind of tangible things that we can maybe imagine. And then maybe we'll do one quick big picture question to end off. So the, the specific one, I had a number of you talk about waste and waste management and waste solutions and recycling. Um, how can we manage what can you can you give us some really specific examples of things that are going on in your communities around managing waste and things that people who are here you know maybe they're involved in similar projects or are thinking about that what give us some examples of things that you've been involved in that would be great okay yeah so uh we we specifically thought it's important while we manage waste we also provide job opportunities for young people so we have a social enterprise and then we say to young people uh you you have nothing to do you got no job so we have this committee that we talk to some partners to begin giving stopping or compensation to young people who will collect waste and so on the weekly basis our young people move into the different part of the community and specific thing about it is we recruit those young people from the same community so it makes it much easier you work to where you live so they go around in the community there's a specific uh site that has been identified to bring those waste and then then the city corporation can come and remove them so that's exactly what we're doing. We collect those ways. At the same time, we provide job opportunities. Right. Thank you. Karen. The Philippines has mentioned that we produce a lot of uh, plastic waste. I mean, we use a lot of plastic waste. And uh, what we are doing right now is that we put up this big box in front of our YMCA where people could put their uh, plastic uh, battles and uh, we are working with one organization there is an organization in the Philippines called Echo Bricks what they do is they transform this um, plastic waste into chairs or even use it to build like um, foundation for like a uh, stairs or something like that and so this is what we do we try to mobilize the community by asking for their ways and then we look for organization that could help us with that okay. tony what? little note because uh, this is part of uh, lebanon uh, suffering right now about the waste management especially the solid waste uh, and it's like uh, it's terrifying and it's uh, it's all over the news uh, our our first it, it need multiple dimension of solutions for for any waste management like you said even if you try to do recycling and but you have every 30 second you have three uh, 
yeah. So it's it's pretty difficult to to find solution for this in try in trying just to be innovative. It's it need a multiple dimension of solution. One of it is policies, and that was like that was the first focus of uh, of our work. But of course, on the other hand, you need two two to tango. So you need a good governance. You you need also a lot of transparency. So our our discussion in Lebanon now, whether we we burn the solid waste or we we do recycle, uh, and and how we go, we're gonna uh, go about it. And um, I think the the impediment is how the government is dealing with the issue. Uh, not not NGOs, not just NGOs, and also the, like. There's so many uh, uh, issues mushrooming around the, the topic. One of them is also uh, environmental NGOs. So it's complicated, but it, it's, it needs more clarity and more transparency to, to have a, an overhaul, a wholesome uh, solution. Okay, I'm going to ask you one final question each. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody the same question. And even though it sounds like a potentially a negative, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking because I think it's possibly how we're all thinking about this. Um, so maybe we'll start at, at your end, Joe, and come this way. Um, what is the biggest challenge you face in your work right now? And what can we do and what can you do and how are you thinking about that? You, you know, a couple of sentences. <laughs> yeah, thanks for letting me go first. Um, so the the biggest challenge, I mean, it's it's multi-dimensional. I think uh, I'm biased. I've talked about our minds and our hearts, and I think winning um, the battle of hearts and minds is a humongous challenge. Um, and then I think the policy change, really, although that is beginning to change quickly, the more we advocate, the more it's, it's easier for policy change to happen. Um, but I think the biggest challenge is our hearts and minds and being able to empower people where they are uh, is probably the biggest one. So just a little one. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I, th I think the biggest challenge is the mindset Without, without proper policies is the mindset of people. We, we woke up on uh, getting our groceries uh, in plastic. It's very difficult to have different solution right now. If there is a policy, we can build awareness and, and do uh, uh, change, change impact, impactful changes, I mean. Uh, but without that, it's, it's very difficult to work on individual mindset to change the way uh, you go to work, you, you eat, you bring groceries to the house, it's very difficult without, uh, it's, one, it's entangled, one complete the other. Without it, it's very difficult to act by heart. Thanks. Yeah, uh, the major challenge for me is the capacity gap we have. Because even the sustainable development goals, especially the goal, the, the goal that speaks to environment, is not popularized. They, they are written in English, they are written in the books, but they are not to where the common guys are. So because a lot of young people don't know what is there, what the goal says about environment, what you're supposed to do, what the policy says. So because of that, we go about doing what we're supposed to do because of that huge capacity gap. If we are aware of those things, it's going to cut down. Yeah. The biggest challenge for me is maintaining the level of enthusiasm, like when you begin. And uh, I think it's important to realize that along the way, maybe there are people who will join you, but along the way, there are also people who will be going to different directions and not support you with your program. But then you just have to realize that it's always just a process. You really just keep on going no matter like how difficult it may be. Para nosotros, para mí es la migración, el problema que tenemos más más grande. For me, the greatest problem is migration. Eh, los jóvenes están saliendo de las comunidades y nosotros lo que estamos haciendo es promoviendo eh, alternativas con, de emprendedurismo rural donde los jóvenes puedan crear algún tipo de negocio y trabajar desde esas comunidades. Young people are leaving their country and we are trying to create uh, schools and uh, uh, teach the young people 
uh, to work the land so that they don't need to leave the country. Thank you. Um, I think the biggest challenge, not just for me personally, but for the organization that I work for, the United Nations, is that the lack of willingness to act and the lack of willingness to politically commit to take bold actions to implement the agreements that we've already agreed. Um, I think the discussion still remains at a very surface level. Where we're still talking about climate change as a concept or as a you know, hoax or like a, a, some kind of a different reality that doesn't exist, where every day millions of people's lives are being affected because of climate change. In the Lake Chad Basin, there are new conflicts emerging between tribal groups because they are fighting for the same small drops of water that is left in um, whatever the, cha the, the, the lake in the Chad Basin because of the extensive droughts. In my home country, Sri Lanka, farmers are committing suicide because they cannot produce enough harvest to sell and feed their families. In northern Nigeria, young women and girls have to walk extra miles and miles to find food and water because of extensive droughts. On the way, get, they get subjected to rape, to sexual abuse, and some of them never come home. So climate change is not a concept. It's a reality that many millions of people all over the world are living. So our action to tackle climate change should come now if we are serious about saving our planet because there's no planet B. So we're just coming to the end of this panel. Um, I just want to quickly reflect on some of the things that, that I heard today. And I think given that we, you know, this is entitled Climate Action Now and what can the summit do with climate action, perhaps, you know, you came into this thinking that it really was about the individual and what we can all do at home. And there certainly is um, a lot of thinking around that. But very interestingly, at least from my perspective, much of this was related, what we heard today was related to being very specific in your communities, understanding your communities and being part of the solution uh, within your communities. But at the same time, the collective action and the voice and the information and, and, and having the desire to change our systems and mindsets and redesign. So with that, it just uh, is left for me to thank our panel and we have some little thank you things that I'm going to give you. Um, and please join me in thanking what a wonderful group we have here today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.